Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever you're listening. This is Davisville on KDRT-LP 95.7 FM in Davis, California. We live at kdrt.org online. I'm Bill Buchanan. Thank you for tuning in. Well, it's often said that some places you should be sure to see are ones you never do because they're close. And so because you could go anytime, you never get around to it. For those of us who live in the Davis area, the Berryessa region could qualify as such a place. Most of us know there's a reservoir up there, a lake, plus mountains that create the west side of the valley we live in. But if we're fortunate enough to have time and ability to see some of California's natural splendors, we might more readily head off to the Pacific Coast, or to Yosemite, or Lake Tahoe, or the Redwoods. A few geologists and naturalists in Davis have written a book that should help move Berryessa more into the foreground, and one of them is on our show today, Mark Oshofsky a retired naturalist who lives in Davis. The other writers are Eldridge and Judith Moores, Peter Schiffman, and Bob Schneider. And their book is Exploring the Berryessa Region, a Geology, Nature, and History Tour. Mark, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome, thank you. You know, uh, I, as I read through the book, I thought this is a really good book for summer uh, when late sunsets and clear skies uh, create room to get outside. Why focus on Berryessa? Berryessa is an area that has um, incredibly complex geology, a lot of geological wonders in that area, and most people don't necessarily appreciate it. Geologists around the world have actually appreciated it and fly in from all over to look at it. The area is also part of a new national monument, the um, Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument, that just celebrated its 50th anniversary um, last week or so. It also has a lot of uh, it's an ecological transition zone between the Sacramento Valley and the coast. And you can see a lot of changes in vegetation as you go through. And there's some interesting history, both indigenous people, some of the um, opening of California with uh, the Bear Flag Revolt, and other history since then. So it tells a, it's a very interesting area from three different perspectives. And could you define the region for us a little bit? Uh... As you pointed out, it includes the snow mountain, and so it's much more than just the lake itself. The, the National Monument extends all the way from um, Lake Berryessa all the way up to Snow Mountain, and I think it's Calusa County. Our book is focusing on just the Berryessa region, which is the southern one-fifth of that monument. It's the area uh, from winters uh, out to uh, Lake Berryessa itself on the west side, and then west into Pope Valley and Childs Valley and uh, Capel Valley, that area. It gets a little bit into the Napa watershed, but not very much. People from Napa can easily access this area as well as people from the Sacramento Valley side. One of the things that, honestly, I appreciated about the book, but I wanted to ask about is that you've, uh, the sort of the heart of the book is uh, basically a car tour where people could follow, I think it's about a 21 mile route, although you say it would take all day if someone you know, follows it the, with the hikes you, you uh, suggest. Why focus on, on that route as opposed to say hiking or something? Why, why focus on the road? The, the road gives you access to a lot of different locations around the, um, the, the region. The actual route of the uh, road guide is over a hundred miles actually. And it allows you to see a variety of geological features from the Great Valley uh, group near the, on the eastern edge, some subduction zones over on the west side of Lake Berryessa, uh, some really deeply buried Franciscan rocks that have been dragged up from 18 miles below the surface. So the road tour gives you ability to look at all of those different features, as well as uh, seeing different elements of history for the area. The... uh you know, you, you talked about geology, and it struck me actually at the very start where you said this area is known to geologists around the world. And of course, if you're not a geologist, you wouldn't necessarily know that. And it makes me think, you know, traveling someplace far away and saying I'm from this area, that a geologist would go, oh, you're near Berryessa? Whereas locally, you might think, yeah, <laughs> why does it matter? Well, <laughs> it's, it's yeah maybe not all geologists will um, be fascinated will know the name Berryessa but they know the coast of California as this incredible um, continental collision zone and where you have one continental plate being dragged under the other and then that whole exposure being 
put up on land for people to walk around and drive around and look at. Most places in the world, you would have to go in a submersible down into the deep ocean to see this. So this is an area where it's really exposed. And a lot of um, uh, structural geologists know about this, so they can go and learn and see that directly just by driving to it. So now that, that's an interesting comment that the geology of that area in most places in the world would be underwater. Do I understand that correctly? Well, the, at, at a subduction zone where you have an oceanic plate being pushed down underneath a, uh, a continental plate like North America. So you'll see this off the coast of uh, South America. You see it in various places at these margins of the continental plates. But to say off the coast of South America, you would have to go down into the trench off the ocean to actually see the submarine fans that flow out into the abyssal plain to see all of the, um, the uh, it's a rock factory where you have serpentine being pushed up. Some of these areas have serpentine mud volcanoes that are like 15 kilometers across. They're only down in the bottom of the Marianas Trench in the, in the Western Pacific. We have mud volcanoes exposed right here at Berryessa up on land. You know, in reading the book, one of the things that kind of fired my imagination was reading about the lava in this area, which I think it's described in the book as saying that it's similar to, to lava that's in eastern Oregon and Idaho and up by Yosemite. And it just fires the imagination to think that lava from a place like that might have come here. Yeah, this is um, the Lovejoy Basalt, which is exposed on this tour only at the mouth of Puda Creek Canyon. And it has flowed 150 miles as hot liquid lava from the Northern Sierra up near Susanville. And the, um, this is related to a lot of the, the flood basalts that are out in the Columbia Plateau of Eastern Oregon and Washington. This came out around 14 million years ago and actually flooded at one point some 25% of the Sacramento Valley over repeated flows. And one of them has extended all the way down to actually it goes to Vacaville along the western edge of the Sacramento Valley. Climbers who go to Browns Valley open space will see uh, basaltic boulders there. They climb on those boulders. That has actually come from the area up around Susanville. So this, this is like a secret history of the region. I mean, maybe it's not really a secret. I guess it's known if you look for it. But I mean, I don't think of this place as having anything to do with volcanoes. Right. And this is really, well, uh, this is one of the most this is one of the volcanic features of the area. Actually, if you go on the western edge of our, our region, you get up into the area east of Napa, onto Angwin and Howell Mountain. Those areas are actually covered by the Sonoma Volcanics and Clear Lake Volcanics. They're less than eight, 8 million years old. As you get into the Napa Valley, there's a lot more volcanics and a lot of the vineyards are grown on volcanic soil. It's very productive for them. You know, we've, we've been talking about the geology and such. The book contains quite a bit beyond the geology. You talked about, you know, the, the history of the people of the area. I mean, that could be a book in itself. But I was interested to read that there have been at least seven different Native American groups over the past 12,000 years that have lived in this area that the book is talking about. And then that leads us to the Patwin, the Winton, and the Lake Miwok, who uh, currently inhabit the area. Um, could you tell us a little bit about these, as, as I say, that could be a book by itself, but could you tell us a little about these original inhabitants and what you find of them in the Berryessa region? When we say there's about seven different um, tribes or peoples, those are in the National Monument, the full length of it. California has had one of the most culturally diverse areas in terms of indigenous people in North America. So divided up, there's so many different tribes and peoples. And even the Patwin people themselves, Patwin is a name that the anthropologists used to group people that spoke languages similar, but they would not call themselves Patwin. They just live in bands and they just speak a similar language. So they're not like a unified group there. The um, Patwin are the people that cover most of the area of our guide. The Lake Miwok come in from um, or live up near uh, Middletown, and they had some villages in the upper um, Pope Valley area. Most of the Patwin were actually uh, south, of, uh, south of 
Rumsey and Cape Valley, they were pretty much exterminated by the 1870s and 1880s due to um, disease like malaria and smallpox. They were killed off. So there was hardly, there was no, no Patwin alive south of there um, by then. Those survivors were up in the northern parts and they settled and they were given land around the Cape Valley for the Cash Creek Rancheria. The Lake Miwok settled in near Middletown for the Middletown Rancheria. So they're both thriving fairly well, as, as well as Native Americans are doing nowadays. Uh, their diversified economy and um, bringing money from ranching and other kinds of agricultural products. Well, and then, of course, the casino is, is one descendant, I guess, of this, because uh, this was their land. And uh, by the way, the laws have changed over the years. It's such that they could have a, a casino there. Are there village sites and such in the mountains that are at all visible? The village sites are known really from historical records. Archaeologists know where they are. There's, there's not really much left in those areas. Berryessa Valley, for example, was home for, had a lot of archaeological sites before it was flooded, and those areas are now underwater. So um, most of those villages, as I said, uh, there was a lot of extermination of Native Californians. So by the time the uh, early settlers showed up in the 1840s and 50s, there were very few people left from that time. What are one or two things that, you know, if you were recommending to somebody first time visiting that region, what are one or two things that you think they should be sure to see? The, um, it, it really depends on the, the, the interests of the person. If you're interested, for example, in history, just knowing uh, as driving up Poudre Creek Canyon and, and, and looking at Monticello Dam and understanding the history of the Poudre Creek Turnpike, the first road through those mountains, the first wagon road, um, the quarry that used to be there, the um, understanding the history of development of that dam. Also to look at Lake Berryess and appreciate the history before 1957 when the dam was completed and uh, how that landscape has changed. And then there's also in the northern end, there's uh, a route that Fremont used uh, to get out over into the Sacramento Valley um, related to the, the California and Mexican War. Oh, that was John Fremont, the uh, explorer. Right. He actually sent some um, spies up Poudre Creek Canyon to get from Sacramento over to Sonoma before the Bear Flag Revolt. And they used that route to avoid being detected by the Mexicans down at Vallejo. The Bear Flag Volt Revolt, we should mention, that was uh, back to going to the start of California's estate, correct? Where uh, the, the land was under the control of Mexico, and this was a revolt against that. Yeah, California was part of Mexico up until that event. Um, Vallejo uh, was living, uh, General Vallejo was living in Vallejo, and he was not getting much support from the Mexican government. When Fremont came in and rallied up the uh, increasing American settlers in the area, he thought it would be great to uh, um, get California as part of the United States. And Vallejo really was, didn't put up much of a fight. It was like, sure, whatever. Uh, he was not getting any support from the Mexicans. So that was the Bear Flag Revolt in Sonoma in, uh, that led to California becoming part of uh, the United States. A quick station ID. We are talking with Mark Hoshovsky. He is one of the writers of a book called Exploring the Berryessa Region, a Geology, Nature, and History Tour. I'm Bill Buchanan, and this program is Davisville on KDRTLP 95.7 in Davis. What are some of the good hikes up there? Uh, there's some really nice views of the valley, aren't there? There are... Um... A very popular hike on the east side, of course, is um, Cold Canyon, which is a UC Natural Reserves, um, very popular place. It's re- not near Monticello Dam. There are some other hikes up on the north end of Berryessa, uh, out of um, Pope Valley. There's a Pope Valley, Pope Creek to Puda Creek Trail, which goes up over the mountains and ends up on Puda Creek as it comes into Lake Berryessa. A lot of the land is, there's quite a bit of private land in the area. There's a lot of conservation easements that have been placed on that land. Those conservation easements do not make the land publicly accessible, but it does keep the land in a protected status. So people do have to be concerned about uh, and be sensitive to private lands out there. 
a good spot to find out more information about trails is the Tuliomi website. That's T-U-L-E-Y-O-M-E. And they have a great index of trails that are available on public land. Um, the book says, if I understand correctly, that the area is more biologically diverse than most of the United States. Is that, did I read that correctly? And if so, kind of how did that happen that this one region ended up with such diversity? There's, there's a lot of biological diversity in the, the coast range. So it's not just simply the Berryessa region. This really includes the area all the way up into the, for the full national monument. So it includes areas that have a lot of coastal influence then interior valley influence like the Sacramento. The east side of the mountains are a rain shadow, so it's much drier, and you have a lot more grass and blue oak woodland. As you go west, you get into moisture fog areas that have this lace, beautiful lace lichen hanging from the trees. Going north, you get up into higher elevations of the Mendocino National Forest, and um, you also have areas with redwoods out on the um, near Pope Valley. You can find redwoods. So there is quite a bit of diversity. The, the, the biologic, one of the richest biological parts are the serpentine soils. And serpentine is a challenging soil for most plants to grow on. It has a chemical imbalance. And it's, very, it's a host for a lot of rare plants. So you'll find outcrops of serpentine throughout this region that host those plants. So if I understand correctly, it's, and of course, there's also altitude. Uh, when I first came to Yolo County, I was surprised that there are mountains in Yolo County that go to 4,000 feet. Um, because living in Davis, I think we're 15 feet or 50 feet. It just doesn't seem to compute. But there's difference in altitude. There's difference in rain. There's difference in topography. And, and so all that combined just engenders this diversity of, of uh, biodiversity. Right. Yeah. The, um, the early settlers, when they were in, uh, in the Sacramento Valley, as they looked to the west, they saw the Blue Ridge. And the Blue Ridge is essentially a 2,500 foot high mountain wall that's about 40 miles long. And trying to navigate that was a challenge for them. They um, found a route up Puda Creek and they created the Puda Creek Turnpike. The other route over it was out of Cape Hay Valley, out of um, Brooks that went up about 1,700 feet over to Lake Berryessa and then eventually, well, to Berryessa Valley at the time and led up to Clear Lake. Um, they were getting up, they're going up there for the uh, mercury mining area primarily and some of the borax deposits. In fact, I wanted to ask about it. I was surprised how many mines there were up there too. I read in the book that the references to dozens of mining sites, but it wasn't for gold, right? Right. The, um, in, the, in the broader region beyond Berryessa, there was quite a bit of uh, mercury mining. They were using the mercury to export over to the 49er area over in the Sierra where people were needed mercury for extracting gold. So there's a lot of mercury mining out of, the, out of that region. They also extracted chromite and magnesite from the serpentine. So there were some fairly large uh, mines in the area in the late 1800s. Those are now mostly gone and abandoned. So you've spent quite a bit of time up there, I'm, I'm sure, over the years. First, how did you discover it? I mean, uh, you're, you're a naturalist, but um, did you grow up in this region or what, what first drew you out there? Well, I've been living in, in Davis for about 35 years, and I am just obsessively curious about all kinds of places. And I like to go exploring all the time. So I'm out traveling through the Berryessa region. I actually do a lot of hiking in the Sierra as well, a lot of different places. And the Berryessa region is close. And during the winter time is, is really the best time to be out hiking and exploring that area. There are times after the fires that are burned through that the wildflowers are just incredible, just an amazing wildflower display. And it just was a local area that... Um, I found fascinating and I knew about the geological background on it, but I could never, I'd been on a few trips with Eldridge Moores. He and Judy led public tours of geology for about 20, 25 years in that area. And I'd been on several of his trips and I didn't, I wasn't satisfied with understanding the area. So that's why I thought it was useful to work with Eldridge to create a more in-depth description that would be available for people in an easy to read way 
to explain more what he was trying to say on his field trips. Well, and that, that's a question I wanted to ask as well, is what led you all to write this book? And uh, several of you are geologists, either by profession or, or training. I mean, is that how you met? And is that how you decided? You just said, look, Barry Essen needs this kind of a guidebook? We've all known each other uh, over the years. Um, Peter Schiffman is an emeritus professor and has worked alongside Eldridge, who was an emeritus professor at UC Davis. They worked alongside together for decades. And Bob Schneider has been involved in a lot of conservation issues, and I've been involved in conservation issues. So we kind of know each other. The drive was partly when I, I wanted to learn more about the area, and I felt that if I wrote myself a road guide, and if I could understand it, that would teach me more about the geology. But I ran into some problems with uh, understanding geology maps. There were two maps next to each other that did, just did not match up. So I, I asked Eldridge if he knew somebody who could help me figure that out. And he was willing to go out into the field with me. And as we were out in the field looking at stuff, I said, we should just take your road guide the simple three-page thing that you have and turn it into a book that other people could uh, read and get access to. And Bob Schneider joined in on that and Peter said, oh, I, I want to enjoy that. And Judy is a, a big part of the program as well. Judy, on, her tour, on the tours that Eldridge and Judy led, Judy's element was sort of bringing in the, um, the humanistic side of things, talking about poetry and appreciating the beauty and uh, all the sort of things that were different than what Eldridge focused on, which was the science part. Mm -hmm. I think the book reflects that. I mean, you, you can, as a reader, anyway, I looked at it and it's a good armchair travel book as well. I mean, I, it makes me want to get out there and see some of these things, but I could just sit there and look at the photos and the stories about the people and the different locations and be drawn into it. And the maps, I really appreciate it. I have this sense of the region, but it's a pretty rustic area even now. You know, if you look at a map, it doesn't necessarily help you comprehend it at a detailed level. Well, except in your book, it, it does. I mean, I see all these different things. So in all the times you've been out there, name a, if, if you would, a, a favorite moment you've had out there, maybe something you've seen or some realization. I think the being in either Childs Valley or the Berryessa Valley and having taken the geology maps, these geology maps you'll see in the book, lots of different colors, lots of lines, but a geologist can interpret that and recreate a three-dimensional structure in his or her head about what that geology is. I created a cross section from that and it really showed me how the, the, the whole area has been folded into these huge anaclines and synclines. And then being out there in the field and just looking at, when you say when you go to Monticello Dam, you see all of that vertical bedding. If you can visualize that bedding extending up into the air, it's just been eroded, it's been gone. But visualize what it used to be was a big structural hill that went off over Berryessa Valley. And visualizing the loss of the erosion of all of that hmm. material down the canyons into the ocean now you just see the pieces of it, but you, you know there's this incredible structure underneath. I thought that was fascinating. So anticline and syncline, I take it are geological terms for a certain kind of a formation. But now listening to you right now, I got a sense, maybe this is part of the reason, at least why some of us will go out and take hikes, is because you see the thing there in front of you. But it's like looking at the stars too. You also see something larger something that maybe isn't right there right now, but you can kind of see or feel the traces of it. That's one yeah, of the reasons I, maybe to go out and get into nature. Yeah, I, I have, um, I worked professionally as an ecologist, but I have a degree in geology and a lo long history, under, you know, in passion with that, but I also enjoy photography. And I find that a lot of people pass through the landscape, either hiking or driving, and for them, it's mostly just a blur. It's like either green stuff or whatever. Sometimes they see a nice view. But if you slow down and you really look more carefully at things, well, when I go hiking, people are a little frustrated because I'm always looking at things and I'm just checking out and wondering about why does this plant grow here? Why is that rock over there? And I'm hoping that the book can help people slow down a little bit more and to look at the world and get a richer experience from traveling through that area. 
you know, it also struck me reading the book that the dam, Lake Berryessa was created by, by the dam in the 1950s. California hasn't built a new major reservoir in about 40 years. So that was fairly late in California's cycle of building dams and such. If the lake weren't there, what would be there? Well, what existed before the dam was a fairly rich agricultural area. They were um, doing a lot of um, farming in the area. There was a town of Monticello. There was a town of, there was they had a cemetery that had to be moved up by Spanish Flat with the construction of the dam. So it was a fairly flat agricultural valley with a, a small town in the area. Um, and it, it, it becomes visible uh, when the lake gets low enough, right? I mean, not that there's much there now. There's the foundations, and I gather there's an old bridge and things like that. Right. You can, uh, there is a bridge down near the, um, just above the dam, uh, that was one of the largest stone span bridges at its time in western, in the western U.S. That's all underwater now. Uh, I'm not sure if that dam actually can be seen when the lake is low enough I did not get a chance to get out there during some of the extreme droughts to, to see any exposure of that. I've seen it over in Folsom Lake and other places, but I, I did not get a chance to see it at Berryessa. I've seen some photos, and I mean, it looks like the bottom of a, a reservoir in a drought. I mean, the, the ground is very, I don't know what that is, you know, dust, it looks like. Anyway, well, we're about to uh, wrap up for today, but uh, when's, when's your next trip out there? How, how often do you go? Well, uh, the summer is not really a, a great time to be out there uh, unless you're out there at some, you know, five or six in the morning when the temperatures are reasonable. It gets quite hot. Um, people will go out there and, it, you know, it can be 90, 100 degrees or so. So I usually wait until about late October to get out there and start hiking. And it's still rather dry, but my favorite time for exploring the area is from about February through uh, early May. That's when most of the flowers are out. Uh, it's green. I've led a number of hikes for groups like Puda Creek Council and Audubon in the area. I'd like to be able to do that again once we can get over this virus um, situation. Yeah. I'd love to be able to do some public tours uh, following this guide out there, but that's carpooling. There's all these different constraints we're facing right now. Well, it'll be there, and your book, I imagine, will be there too. So, Mark, thank you very much for talking with us today. You're quite welcome, Bill. We've been talking with Mark Koshofsky, who is one of the contributors, writers of Exploring the Berryessa Region, a Geology, Nature, and History Tour. I'm Bill Buchanan. This is Davis Phil on KDRT. Thank you for listening.